Ladies and gentlemen, sports fans alike, welcome to another edition of Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. One of the couple, two, three best podcasts around. So sit back, grab yourself a cold one and a pole of sausage, park your keister in the front room, and listen to Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. In Chicago, you know that all sports rock. The Bears, Hawks, Bulls, Cubs, and Sox. Pick your favorite, you can choose as long as the... Packers lose for everything you need to know. It's Bill Swarski Sports Talk Chicago. Bill Swarski Sports Talk Chicago. Hey everybody, welcome to another edition of Bill Swarski Sports Talk Chicago. This is your hosts, Alex and Sean. On this episode, we are going to be talking about the Bears schedule finally here. Talking Cubs and White Sox baseball and more. But first, I'd like to thank our sponsor, the Rockford Ice Hogs. If you're not familiar with the Rockford Ice Hogs, they're the AHL minor league affiliate of the Chicago Blackhawks. What does that mean for you? You get to see the stars of tomorrow today at family-friendly, affordable prices. So head on over to icehogs.com, get yourself a hat, shirt, jersey, tickets, and more. Tell them Swirsky Sports sent you. Alex, how have you been this week, my friend? It's been good. How are you doing? This has been a really busy week. So... I have a seven-year-old daughter, as you know, and uh, she is an understudy at a, uh, for a Broadway musical here in the Chicagoland area. And she got a call that she's going to start performing four days a week scheduled. Wow. And, Congrats to her. And she plays two different parts. So two shows a week, she's one part, and two shows a week, she plays a different part. <laughs> and... It's like a three hour musical. Wow. And so she is, we've been shuffling her back and forth to rehearsals and uh, performances and then seeing the performances and like the, she's, she does the late performances, which start at eight on Friday, Wednesdays, Fridays and Saturdays. And we don't get out of there until like 11 o'clock at night. And then wow. it's like a half hour home. So it is, it's been crazy. Is it Bleacher Bumps the musical? <laughs> it is the sound of music. Oh, oh, is she one of the uh, Von Trapp kids? Yes, she plays uh, Gretel and Marta, the two youngest. Really? How cool is that? Yeah, which is funny because she has the growth, the growth spurt. So she, when she plays Gretel, who is supposed to be like four or five, I think she must be five in, in the story. Um, my daughter's seven, but most of the kids are, are older than, than they are, or they're sure. playing. Um, but my daughter is taller than the next kid up who is 10 in real life. Hmm. And then she's as tall as the next kid up who is, uh, also 10 in real life and is supposed to be, so she's it, the, the height order just gets thrown off when she's in there. Yeah. That's funny, and, but that's and, pretty awesome. And the girl who's supposed to play the oldest girl, when she goes, when she's supposed to pick her up, you could see her brace herself because she's picking, up, <laughs> she's picking up a kid that's like, you know, getting close to being as tall as she is. So it's, <laughs> it's, it's funny, but yeah, it's, it's been great. Um, you know, she loves it and it's got like a month left of the run and then we can relax because it, it's been a lot of, a lot of uh, work on her part and a lot of driving on our part. Yeah, yeah. Now, um, are there any known like local actors that are in that show? Like uh, who's playing uh, the captain or, or anyone like that? Um, it's all people that like have a bunch of credits uh, doing like theater. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, and then like most of the adults have done things like Law and Order, Chicago Fire and things like that. Um, but uh, you know, most of them have like a lot of credits for like theater stuff. Yeah, that uh, makes sense. That makes sense. Are you, so what you're saying is Bill Murray is not in the show. Bill Murray. No, no, I don't think I would let my daughter. I love Bill Murray, but I don't know if I'd leave my daughter there with him. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard the story. So <laughs> <laughs> he'd start doing that weird Daffy Duck thing he did when he sang the stretch during the World Series. <laughs> I am 17 going on 18. <laughs> hey, little girl. <laughs> hey, Dad, who's that? Oh, that's just Bill Murray. <laughs> Don't mind him. 
<laughs> like this, he does this. <laughs> you know, it's funny until I, I read the allegations about him. I always thought most of the things he did were just quirky and harmless. Like yeah. Walking up to people's tables at restaurants and, and eating the French fries off their plate. It's like, nobody's going to believe you. All right. That is quirky and funny, you know, but inappropriately touching women. Not so funny. Yeah, I haven't read much of the details, but yeah, that uh, that doesn't sound good. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I wouldn't want anyone, especially my daughter, around that either, if that's the case. Yep. So we the other day we had the Bears schedule come out and nothing surprising. We we all knew who they were playing. Uh, I mean, we for the most part, we know most of the schedule years in advance. Um, because they rotate which division they play and they're always going to play their own division twice. And then once the schedule or the season ends the previous year, you know who the full ro- uh, roster of teams they'll be playing is. But once once you have the order and which games are primetime games and are any of them going to be in Mexico or London or Germany or wherever, you know, you find those out. So it's a, uh, it's kind of, it's, I, I, the NFL has really milked this. <laughs> oh yeah. Big time. I mean, you have these teams, including the chargers doing like a freaking Japanese anime release of the schedule. Like the, they're doing all these things like on, on the media, whether it's like Twitter or Instagram, the, I mean, you saw what the chargers did, right? Like that was mm-hmm. like all out. I respect that. Uh, it would be better though. If they didn't leak before the the teams were announcing. Yeah, I know. But I mean, it it didn't really matter with the Bears because I thought what the Bears did was just incredibly lame. Well, I mean, when your team is run by, you know, octogenarians and and uh, it should have just been ding dong George and the purple (laughs) crayon. It's just him just drawing on the wall with the crayon. His mom comes in. I thought I told you not to write on the walls anymore, Georgie. <laughs> but it's the schedule this year, mama. <laughs> oh, my God. If he calls her mama. <laughs> <laughs> uh, mama. <laughs> mama, I made wet season my diaper type again. Are we five? Yes. Uh, oh my goodness. But you know, Sean, looking at the schedule, you know, again, you knew who we were going to play, but you, what you want to look at the schedule, two things, you know, one, obviously, like you said, are we going to have primetime games? I mean, we know we're always going to have primetime games and you always have a sense when you look at the schedule, which ones are most likely to, you know, you're going to have a primetime game against Green Bay. You know, if you're playing Dallas, you're likely going to have a primetime game. You know, you, you know, teams like that, or if it's a, you, you know, like a, a big, big time matchup, like you could look and be like, oh, you know, the big market bears are playing the defending champions. You know, you, you see stuff like that. And the other thing, too, is you look at just how the schedule plays out when your bye week is or when you play certain teams. Because the thing I always look for is when do they play the Packers? Is it, spread out is it close together is it first half is it second half who are you playing in the final three weeks i mean it's always the damn vikings week 17 or 18 now it really you is know. but this year it's it's at home it, it's it was always minnesota week the final week this year it's at home yeah with a tbd time slot so it means it's gonna be sunday night football <clears throat> it, they're probably waiting on what it's gonna look like you know, are they, is it going to be for a playoff spot, a division rival to playoff spot? Is it going to be like the last few years and pretty meaningless? You know, it's probably what they're waiting on. But I think what's really important to look at these schedules is just how manageable it could be because you can look at the opponents and be like, okay, that's pretty manageable. But how does it all stack up? Are you getting the early, the early games against the bad teams and the tough ones later in the year, vice versa? Is it spread out? I mean, that's really what I look for more than anything when this schedule gets released. I mean, the schedule makers didn't do the Bears any favors. I mean, I you know, they have the schedule itself is, I think I read like the seventh easiest or something like that. 
Um, yeah, you considering the opponents. I mean, it's I don't want to give the team the benefit of the doubt because I don't think they're very good yet, but you look at the schedule and you're like, you know, it it's not that awful when you look at it. No, no, it really isn't. But you just right off the bat, you start off against um you know, what looks like going to be good opponents. <clears throat> right. Right. Uh, so you're just like, Oh, really? You know, give, give us a little bit of a break here. Let, let this team get, get some, uh, you know, footing under them before you, you start having them play, um, you know, these good opponents, let them, let them get the, uh, the, the dog turd teams, let them play, let them play the jets and the giants at home to start the, the season. So I have the schedule written out and I did round one of my various off season rounds of schedule prediction. You know, did you want to go through them and predict, predict W or L or yes for that matter? Yes. So week one is a noon game on a Sunday against the San Francisco 49ers. I put that as an L. I mean, the 49ers are just better, but it's not. I, I don't think it's a game where you say, you know, the Bears are going to lose that game. I just I give the benefit of the doubt to the team that almost went to the Super Bowl last year. Uh, yeah, I want to preface what I'm, I'm doing here quickly, because do I because I, I went through this quickly and before we, we started recording I have them with a better record than last year. And there's a few reasons why. One, we have a new head coach, new offensive system. The hope is that they're not going to be willfully bad. Like, I I don't think Matt Nagy intentionally tried to lose, but I think he was just so stubborn and he would rather lose his way than win doing something that wasn't his way. And frankly, I think last year, even though you got a few wins, you got a nice win against the Seahawks, you know, and, you know, you beat the really awful Giants at home last year. I mean, really, when they started going through that midseason losing streak, it it almost looked like some players were just going through the motions. Yeah, and I don't think that, you know, the team gave up, but I think certain players gave up. And Allen Robinson, Allen Robinson gave up. Um, but you know, also the strength of schedule is a lot easier this year than last year. Right. And, um, and I think that's going to be a factor in there. And I think the, the offense is going to be better by just default. It can't be worse. And the, I I'm hoping the defense will be more competent with just a scheme change. Um, and having know. more than one reliable secondary player. Right. You know, people will be like, well, you lost Khalil Mack, but Khalil Mack missed most of last season. Yeah, he did. What he, he missed did. 12 games, something like that. He missed a lot of games. So, you know, you're like, well, it's the same thing with Allen Robinson. When you say, oh, hey, this offense lost their number one receiver in Allen Robinson. Allen, Allen Robinson caught 38 catches last year for 410 yards. Do you remember when Megatron retired from Detroit yes. and you saw Matt Stafford really put up some nice numbers after people said, oh, he doesn't have his number one receiver anymore because he spread the ball out a little more? I just I, I get that Allen Robinson was on paper the far and away most talented receiver on that core, but. You know, the way things went last year, and again, I'm not saying that this wide receiver core is good, but you do have an opportunity here to at least spread things out a little more and maybe get a little more consistent production from certain guys. I, You know, I just, you know, losing Allen Robinson isn't everything. I'm not saying you want to lose a talented player like that, but he was clearly done here, and you're going to have a whole different scheme than last year. So, yeah, I mean, the guys that they lost. So Khalil Mack. Do you, do you, are you able to replace Khalil Mack as a hundred percent healthy? Oh, absolutely not. No, just no, but you weren't, you're not replacing a hundred percent healthy Khalil Mack. You're replacing a guy, a Khalil Mack that missed six games or 12 games. That's a lot more palatable. And this is not a dig at him. It's just saying is when you look at last year to this year, that's what you're replacing. Akeem Hicks. 
is anybody on this defensive line as good as Akeem Hicks when Akeem Hicks is healthy and wants to play? No. No. But Akeem Hicks, there were times where he just didn't really want to play, and there was times when he was injured. So that's what you're replacing. Uh, You know, you replace Danny Trevathan. Did Danny Trevathan really even play much last year? I I mean, last year when we were watching the team, I forgot he was even still on the roster at times. Um, Alec Ogletree, I I don't even think he signed anywhere. You're not really missing him that much, and you could easily bring him back Mm -hmm. if you wanted him. Um, You're upgrade. Theoretically, you are upgrading a cornerback because you had just hot doo doo sandwiches at a cornerback. You know, uh, you you Artie Burns and hot doo doo sandwiches. <laughs> um, your other safety, like you know, you had you had journeymen and backups playing the the opposite Eddie Jackson. You're hoping that Jaquan Brisker is a huge upgrade over that. Um, so yeah, and and you have a better a better defensive. You're hoping it's a better defensive philosophy in there because this defense took a huge step back once Vic Fangio left. And on offense, sure. Um, you know, the offensive line rotated and we don't, we don't know what this offensive line is going to look like. And I don't think the coaching staff is, but that doesn't change the fact that we had arguably the worst center in the league last year in Sam Mustafer. Uh, you, you had a 40 year old left tackle who played well, but he was 40. Um, yeah, he played well for 40. You had Jermaine Affetti starting most of the games. Mm. And so you, and James Daniels played. Okay. Um, so you, you're hoping that you're upgrading there. Uh, I mean, Larry, Tevin Jenkins was a second round draft pick that you had a first, the last regime had a first round grade on. And once he was healthy, um, you saw potential towards the end of the season, hoping that comes about, comes out right away. Larry Borum had a night. He, you know, there was some, there was some hiccups here and there, but overall I thought for a fifth round rookie, Hugh, you nailed it with him. Um, mm-hmm. And here he got a year under his belt and he's going to have whole training camp, probably going in with starting reps. So you expect him to, to get better. Um, you're definitely, Def- or you hope that your free agent center that you signed is going to be an improvement over Sam Mustafer. Um, So you, you expect the offensive line to be better. The wide receiver core is from last year to this year is significantly better. Is it significantly better than it was two years ago? No, but last year, because Allen Robinson was a shell of himself and you had Demir bird and Jakeem grant and Marquise Goodwin. Like those are, those are guys that I don't, I don't even know if they've signed anywhere. I, I really haven't kept tabs on them, honestly. Maybe Jakeem Grant has, but really they just like, these are, these are bottom roster guys and Mooney Mooney is is good. Um, And your leading receivers last year in per game, Darnell Mooney was your leading receiver in eight of the 17 games. Marquise Goodwin was the leading receiver in one Cole Komet in three Shaquem Grant, uh, Demir Bird, and David Montgomery were the leading receivers in one game each. And Allen Robinson was the lead receiver in two games. And I want to put an asterisk by those because you're like, oh, Allen Robinson led the team in receiving two games. Can I? Can you guess how many yards he had in each of those games that he was the lead receiver in? Where no Bears player had more receiving yards in that game than him. How many yards in each of those games? How many yards? Yes. So in those two games where Allen Robinson led the Bears in that game in receiving. So like this is an average between the two. 
I didn't know. I just, you could just guess each, either game, how many yards receiving he had in either of those games. Okay. Um, I'll say like 18 and like 25. It was 27 and 53. Okay. So one was a little higher, but okay. But still yeah. he had 27 receiving yards and he led the bears and 53 and he led the bears like that. That's just, so that's who you're replacing. Um, so I, I I'm, this is why I have more faith in the, in the bears and some of these toss up games, like last year, the average bears loss was by almost two touchdowns. So yeah. I went through and figured out the average margin of loss. And it was, wow. You really went out on this. My it, first round is just like, kind of go through it and be like, eh, eh, eh. I just wouldn't, I, I went through it like that, but then I wanted a caveat because I don't want to be like some weird homer. Like, just so they're going to win 10 games because they think they're awesome. What dummy. <laughs> like I, I just wanted to say that some of these games where they're kind of toss ups, I think the bears are going to be in a lot more of these games than they were last year, because when the average, oh, I think so. I, I think they will be in more games too. I, I don't disagree there. Yeah. The average loss last year when they lost was by 13.54 points each game. That's terrible. Like when your average law, when you lost 11 games and you averaged two touchdown losses, that's terrible. I don't think you're not going to see that this year. Um, you hope so going back to this i also have san francisco as a loss i think this is a very good team and um i don't know if trey lance is ready to play i think the nfl and the the tv networks and are all hoping it'll be a justin fields trey lance matchup oh absolutely but, but I think it's going to be Jimmy Garoppolo because it does not seem like Jimmy Garoppolo is going to get traded. And I don't know if Trey Lance is ready to step in. So um, I think it'll be a close game, but I have the 49ers lose or winning. Me too. Uh, week two is a, a Sunday night game against the Green Bay Packers in Green Bay, Wisconsin. Yeah, hang an L on that one. That is a guaranteed L. I, I mean, for obvious reasons. The Bears have just been owned by the Green Bay Packers for a long time, and I don't see that changing this year. No, no, maybe in a year or two, but not this year. I mean, this year I'm, I've still got the old 0-2 prediction, so. My hope is that it they're competitive losses. Uh, right. I mean, <clears throat> I mean, last year you lost um, the game at home by 10, and you lost the one in Green Bay by 15. Like, th those aren't, I wouldn't call those competitive losses. Uh, I'm hoping that if you lose, it's single digits. M you know, maybe maybe it's on a last-second field goal. That's what I'm hoping for is that you start changing the mindset that, you know what, we, even if we lose, we can compete with green Bay. Right. Right. Uh, game three is a nooner against lovey Smith and the Houston Texans. I think that's their first win of the year. Yes. And I want to point out that, did you know, uh, let me say that did you know for about two more minutes but there's a you did did you know coming up um week four is in new jersey against the new york football giants i'm going to give that a win as well i am as well just don't think the giants are very good Ye you know i think they will be better because they won't have a, a, a dummy as their head coach. Um, but I don't think, I don't believe in their quarterback and I don't know if Saquon Barkley is ever going to be the same guy. Right. Uh, I just think that just like the lions I think they're, they're going to be on the right path. They just mm -hmm. are not there yet. Agreed. I think the bears, even though they're not where they're going to be either. I think the bears are 
ahead of, of those two teams in the process. So I'm going to go with a win as well. Week five, I have them at a noon Sunday game going to Minneapolis to play the Vikings. I'm giving that a loss. I am as well. And this is where the did you know came up. So at this point, we have the Bears, both of us, at two and three. Mm -hmm. At this point last year, the Bears had a winning record. Yeah. Yeah. They beat uh, the Raiders and things were actually looking pretty good. Yeah, they beat the Raiders, they beat the Lions, they beat the Bengals. The Bungles. Uh, that's what we thought they were. And then the Bengals figured out, oh, hey, we're good. And then came within a minute of the Super Bowl. Yes. Um, let's see. Week six. This is where last season the wheels fell off. Like you had a nice win against the Las Vegas Raiders. And the wheels just fell off. Everything went south. You hope that this doesn't happen this year. But week six will be against the Washington Commanders in Chicago. And it will be a Thursday night game. I'm giving that a win. I just don't think that team's all that great. I mean, I don't think they're awful, but I think they're beatable. I have that as a loss. And okay. I, here's my reason. I think offensively the bears are better and I think it's going to be a very low scoring game, but that defensive line of Washington is pretty ridiculous. And I think you're going to see Justin Fields running for his life a lot. It, it is, it's, it is going to be tough to face that it is. Um, it's certainly not a gimme game. That's for sure. I think, I think it's going to come down to turnovers um, and so I, I have Washington commanders winning that one. Um, our first, uh, disagreement, if yes. you will. And I really, I, I really wanted to chalk that one up to a win, but in a second season, I think riverboat Ron is going to have that team, even though I don't think they're good. And I do not believe in Carson Wentz. I, I feel like he is going to have that team ready to play. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Um, then the next week is going uh, at a Monday night game. So the Bears have like a mini buy. They go from Thursday night to Monday night. And they go to New England to pay, play the Patriots. That's a loss for me. I mean, have we ever won at Gillette Stadium? No, but I chalked this one up as a win. Really? Yes. I don't believe I, I think we saw who the Patriots were towards the end of last season. And I don't know if I believe in their quarterback and I'm going to put this out. There is the new England Patriots. Currently we are in mid may, literally in the middle of may. They do not have an offensive coordinator and they do not have a defensive coordinator. So I don't know. The, the talk is that Matt Patricia might be the offensive play caller. Oh, man. So I think, and I don't know if the Patriots brought in enough weapons to help um, or you know, when you have a Tom Brady, you can overcome a lot of these things. And I think they're going to have a stout defense, but um, we're still in October. It's going to be cool, but not cold and not snowy. And I think Justin Fields by this point is going to be turning a corner. And I think you're going to see a victory from the bears. You know, I mean, I kind of agree with you with the Patriots. I don't think Mac Jones in that scheme is all that spectacular. I really don't at all. I just, the reason I say that this is a loss is one, you're going on the road and two, it just, this is a, a, a game where I feel like, you know, even if the Patriots aren't as great, I, I just, I feel like Bill Belichick can just outcoach you. I, I, I agree with you and 
you know, last year under Matt Nagy, I would have been like, oh yeah, absolutely. Matt Nagy is going to get so outcoached. Mm-hmm. I am going to say that I'm going to cautiously sip the Kool-Aid. That's okay. I mean, I get it. That's, I respect that. I mean, I think that there is definitely a path to victory in this game. You can look at this game right here and say, you know what? This might be a bigger toss-up than maybe – because, look, I mean, as a, as a football fan, even though Tom Brady is gone, has been gone there for several years, it's just easy to look at the Patriots and be like, oh, that's going to be a really tough game. You know, that's just kind of your your flinch, your tick almost. You just assume it. And you look at last year, they had Mac Jones. They got absolutely – bounced in the playoffs but you know they still got to the playoffs and Bill Belichick is still a really good coach so you know I I definitely think there's room for victory there I'm just not ready to put it there yet yeah I just feel that you know when Tom Brady was there that his magic and ability to make plays coupled with Bill Belichick really created something special that was hard to beat And when you take Tom Brady out of that and you replace it with Mac Jones, and I'm not shitting on Mac Jones, but he's not Tom Brady. He's a game manager. He really is. And I think he could be a good game manager. Sure. Me too. Um, But, uh, you know, he's not going to take the game into his own hands. You know, and like, I mean, you know, and that's not a knock either. I think Eli Manning was for the vast majority of his career, other than those Super Bowl runs where he made some crazy lucky throws that I, I think Eli Manning was a game manager. I think uh, he was, if you're going to say he was a game manager, that's as good of a game manager as you can possibly get. I will grant that. That is probably the def, the picture you put in the dictionary definition. Um, But I, you know, I don't know what the ceiling of Mac Jones is, but I, don't think he's he is that good right now um and and i think there's not a good enough supporting cast around him to be able to take over a game and i think the bears are going to be well coached enough um i'm just hoping i'm just hoping that our new head coach doesn't get completely owned by bill belichick wasn't the last game we played in Foxborough when we lost like 50 to 10 and uh, Lamar Houston tore his ACL celebrating a sack of the backup quarterback when the game was over? Did he tear his ACL or did he rupture his Achilles? It's something. He did something with his knee. He, it was, he, he hurt himself very badly. But yeah, he sacked Tom Brady after the game was well out of hand and was celebrating and hurt himself. Yeah, 24th. That might have been the last time they were actually in Foxborough because the last time they played the Patriots, I think it was 2018 when our game tying Hail Mary to uh, Kevin White was just like a yard or two short. Yes. They obviously beat Tom Brady with Nick Foles a few years ago, but that's when he was on the Bucks. Yeah. And then when he didn't know what down it was. Yeah. Four. Um, four. Yeah. I, I think, I, I again, I'm not burying the Patriots, but I think a lot of the magic and the, the, the mysticism of playing the Patriots is, is gone. Well, it's hard when you don't have arguably the greatest competitor in football history or one of the greatest competitors. Yes. And, and I think there was two nails that kind of drove that home is one Tom Brady leaving. The other one is when Bill Belichick got out coached against the Titans. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And I think then the whole, like, you know, uh, it was like the, the water on the witch in the wizard of Oz. It just, everyone went, Oh, okay. Let me afraid of it anymore. And it's not to say Bill Belichick won't outcoach you because he would outcoach most everybody. But, um, I, I think the, the hope is here that, you know, you just, you, you play a lot better and don't leave it in the hands. Let's, of, let's get our first yeah, step against them there. Yeah. Um, week eight going to Dallas as a noon Sunday game. I could go either way with this game, but I did give it a loss. Um, I just, I, you know, 
we've had we've played the Cowboys overall pretty well over the past decade plus. I mean, you go back to even 2010, I think they've beaten them almost every time but once. I know they lost to them in 2014, but we beat them in 2010. We beat we you remember that Monday night game or was it a Thursday night game? It was one of the two in 2012 where they picked off Romo like five times. Yep, I remember. I was at the gym and it was on and uh I went to this tiny little gym and they had uh, two TVs and they had the, the sound up and I was working out watching the game. Cause I, th- I thought it would be just a horrible blowout and, and it wasn't the bears won. And I was like, wow, this is crazy. I wish I was at home watching this instead of being on the treadmill. <clears throat> it was freshman year of college. My three buddies and I were watching the 100 lost Cubs play the 100 lost Astros. <laughs> In the bleachers. Um, But I have this game as a loss as well, because if things, things go the way that you expect them to with everybody staying healthy with the Cowboys, that offense is pretty potent. Mm -hmm. And yes, I just don't know if the bears are going to be able to hang with that. Um, So I think that's, that's a tough one in Dallas. That is a tough one. And I think that uh, it could be an entertaining game. You could put some points on them, but uh, yeah, it's going to be tough to beat. Week nine, uh, Miami in Chicago, a noon game. That's a loss. I have that as a victory. You're not as high on Tua, are you? I'm a little bullish on him as well, but I don't know. I'm not that high on Tua and it's November in Chicago. I think that's going to negate a little bit of that speed that the team has. Um, Uh Oh, Sean's a bear weather truther. No, no. I am a soldier field has shitty grass believer. (laughs) As once you start getting in November, that field gets real bad. And it's, it's tough to have a track me in November in Chicago. And you are literally I, sweating meatball sauce trying to justify this. Let me wipe my brow with some garlic bread. <laughs> <laughs> mm, delicious sweat. Yum, um, yum. No, I, if this game was in Miami or if this game was in September or October, uh, I'm probably I'm probably saying that this is a Dolphins win. Um, I think this is where home advantage does have a home field does have an advantage because uh, I think, I think you're going to see um, those lightning fast receivers struggle a little bit with slips and, um, and, and the sod coming up and uh, you know, two is not going to put some accurate passes there. So um I'm, I think this is going to be a bears victory. All right. Um, Week 10 Detroit comes to town for a noon Sunday game. I got that as a win. Yeah, me too. I, I, you know, last year the bears got two victories. I think both teams are better. Um, One better coached and one um, just proved talent. But I, I still don't think the until the Lions get a better quarterback, I think they're just, you know, there. You know what's interesting though is I look back at the games against the Lions, and I'm fairly certain that every game against them going back to Thanksgiving 2018 has been a one score game. Because remember that Thanksgiving game in 2018? That was the Chase Daniels start. And that's when they got the pick six by Eddie Jackson. And then was it Cal Fuller that picked off uh, staff for the end zone and the, ended, but that was a, the first one touchdown game. I believe the first game last year was a 10 point victory. I think it was oh, 20, you're right. 24, you're right. 14. You're right. Um, so, but yeah, they have been pretty close. I, I mean, the Thanksgiving was a one score game last year. The two in the two previous, the, uh, the one they won in 2020 was a one score game with the comeback 2019 late comeback on Thanksgiving. And then I think it was one score in 2019, the home one uh, when uh, 
Driscoll went over the line of scrimmage and threw a Hail Mary that didn't work. But yeah, either way, these the the Bears haven't blown out the Lions since their first meeting in 2018. They they've won all but one game since then, but they've all been close. And you know, I know that you are not a, a fan of the Bears playing on Thanksgiving, but I kind of like it. And I feel bad for the players that have to miss Thanksgiving uh, to be playing and the Bears writers that have to miss the Thanksgiving because the Bears are playing. Um, but there's something nice, especially like the last two years, we've we've just stayed at home because of COVID and just me, my wife and kid cooked and just you could sit down and relax and watch the Bears and nobody was bothering you. and um, there wasn't a lot going on because on Thanksgiving, you know, if you're staying home, like you're not, you don't have to run errands. You don't have any other appointments. The day is pretty much eating. And I, it was nice. I mean, maybe as now as the world opens up and uh, we'll be doing something for Thanksgiving. Um, I, it's, uh, it, it, it might be more hectic, but it, it was, it was nice to have that. Um, you know, a Bears game on a quiet day when I literally have nothing else to do but stuff my face. You know, it's not as much the Bears playing on Thanksgiving. Like, I actually would be pretty excited if, like, the Bears were playing the Cowboys on Thanksgiving. Or, like, you know, remember when they played Green Bay and beat them on the in the night game? Like, if they had a night game on Thanksgiving, I think really I just – I was just tired of playing the damn Lions on Thanksgiving. <laughs> okay, I could buy that. It, the time was nice. I'll give it that. It was nice that it was like 1130. You get to watch Bears football on Thanksgiving. That was cool. But like, I just, three of the last four years being subjected to them having the, the, the crappy Bears playing the crappier Lions. It's just like that. That game last year was hilariously terrible. I mean, when you had, you won on the last second Cairo Santos field goal. I mean, just that game was just all sorts of blah. I could just do without having to play the lions on that holiday for a little while. I've seen enough of it. You know, I tweeted something the other week and I'm going to say other than Thanksgiving, I hate Thursday night football. Yeah. Um, I feel like the games have been better in recent years, but for a while they were all just terrible. It's not the game itself. It's just like, I don't know. I'm not prepared for football and I'm usually just busy and I miss most of the games anyway, because it's like, you know, like I've sort of trained myself like, okay, Sunday afternoon football is on. And then Monday night, you know, you, you get the blah from going back to work on Monday. And then you just kind of sit down on Monday night and watch football. And then you're like, okay. Um, and then Thursday, it's just like, you're like, man, you know, I've got to go back to work tomorrow after watching a game. And I don't know. I just don't like Thursday night football. I don't think the players like Thursday night football. And my pitch is you want more primetime games for television. I get it. Is I like the idea of getting rid of Thursday and like on opening weekend, two Monday night games an early and a late game. That would be kind of cool where you come home from work on Monday and literally uh, there's a game starting. You're like, okay, cool. And, uh, you know, you just kick off your shoes and you can watch football and eat dinner. And then there's another game. I like I like the opening weekend because I like the two Monday night games. No, I, I, that's valid. That's fair. Uh, I I know the NFL doesn't care what I think, but that's my thoughts. (laughs) They don't care what a lot of people think. (laughs) Um, all right. Week 11 going to the Atlanta bears for a noon game. That's a win. I have that as a win as well. I don't even know who is quarterbacking Atlanta this year. Do we? 
Um, they they traded Matty Ice. So I, I don't even know who their quarterback is, to be honest with you. I can't remember. Was it the Saints or was it the Falcons that signed Andy Dalton? I thought it was the Saints. You might be right, yeah. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Week 12, last week of November, going to New Jersey to face the New York Jets. I got that as a win. The Jets just aren't very good. I have that as a win as well, but it was a little bit tough for me to put a win going to New York to beat both the Giants and the Jets. That's weird uh, to think about. They're going to be playing in the same stadium twice. Yeah. So, um, I mean, it is, you know, a lot of weeks apart, but I, I just, I'm not a big believer in the Jets until the Jets do something to make me believe in them. I just don't believe in the Jets. I don't think you're the only one. Yeah. Um, and then week 13. So weird anomaly. The Bears do not play outside of Chicago for the whole month of December. Yeah, that's kind of... Well, don't they go... Uh... Oh, wait, is that game against the Lions in January? It is in January. Wow, okay. So it is week 13 against Green Bay in Chicago. Then week 14 is the bye week. Then Philadelphia comes to town. Then Buffalo comes to town. And then they go to Detroit in in January. So, yeah, they do not leave Chicago Chicago. for the first for the month of December. Wow, that's something. So week 13, Green Bay comes to town. Loss. I have that as a loss as well. I do not see them winning that one. Um, And then week 14, which is a really late bye week. Yeah, that's ridiculous. I, why? You you shouldn't have any team shouldn't have a bye week after week 13. I, I think I'm going to throw this out there is the NFL should go to a two bye weeks, two week, two bye week system. I agree. I agree. If you're going to have it like that, have a bye week after like week seven or eight, and then have a bye week after like week 14. Yeah, it's, it's tough. I mean, you have a lot of young players and players hit that wall. You just sort of want to break that up and give them a week off to, you know, get their bodies right and get ready to play. And your bye week doesn't come till week 14. So if you have like, some players banged up or it just is really tough to get them back in that stretch when you, you don't get that bye week until week 14. I mean, you know, they they will have a mini bye when they play Washington on Thursday night. And then the next game is Monday night um, against the, the Patriots, but still like having, not having that bye week till late is, is a tough one. Um, Week 15, Philadelphia comes to town for a noon game. I have a feeling you have this as a win. I have it as a loss. I have this as a loss. Really? The Bears have not played against Eagles very well. No, they have in a while. Like it has been a long while since they beat the Eagles. And I don't think necessarily that the Eagles are that good. Um, but I, if, if Hertz is half the QB that the coaching staff says he is, I think this might be a tough game. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you there. I, as soon as I like just them being the Eagles, I'm like, I don't want to put this as a win. Um, week 16, the Buffalo bills come to town. Yeah, I got to put that as a loss. You're just, you're playing against one of the best. My only hope is that you're close enough to the end of the season that they start resting guys, but no, I have it as a loss as well. Um, yeah. Then week 17, going to Detroit to play the Lions. I have that as a loss. Ooh. Okay. I just think this Lions team is going to be a bit better and... You know, the Bears, the Bears the last few years, they get the wins in Detroit, but 
they've gotten those wins by the skin of their teeth. You know, I mentioned Thanksgiving's, you know, of recent past 2019, they needed a last minute touchdown to beat David Blau. Uh, 2020, they needed an epic comeback and things going their right to win in week one. And then last year, they needed a 28 yard field goal by Cairo Santos to win 16 to 14 against a team that didn't even have a win yet. And I just think that, you know, with the Lions a bit better, I. I just I feel like they're due for a loss in Detroit. They've they've gotten away with some pretty lackluster games there because Detroit's been so lackluster. I just think you're you're gonna finally have a game where Detroit just grabs it out on top. All right, I have that as a victory. Um, again, I just don't believe in Detroit. And yes, you're right. They had to kick a field goal, last second field goal, to beat Detroit 16-14, but. I also am not a believer in Matt Nagy or the system that he puts into place. And yeah, um, you just couldn't score any points. Um, but the final week of the season, the Minnesota Vikings come to Chicago to play the bears. And I have that as a victory. I have that as a win too. Um, I, I think the, I'm not a big believer in, in the Minnesota Vikings. I think they have a good wide receiver core. I think that their quarterback, if you fluster him, even, you know, he's not mobile. And if you fluster him, he, he gets bad pretty quick. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think you can get to him. I don't believe in that offensive line. Um, If they can't get the running game started, I think it's going to be, it's going to be January in Chicago. Again, that turf being terrible, like that's the home field advantage, not bear weather. It's just that terrible turf. Uh, <clears throat> I think the Bears will get the victory. Yep. So I have them at seven and 10. That's where I got them. So I have that one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Look at me. Wow. Nine and eight. Wow. Wow. I just, I, even before looking at the schedule, I just, in my mind, didn't want to give this team more than seven wins right now. I mean, you play the season, you see what happens. That's the thing about the NFL is things can happen in the NFL. You know, if if you scheme right and some things go your way, you win a few games. And I'm sure that Jacksonville beat Buffalo last year. Right. Exactly. And I mean, you look at, you look at who you're playing and you kind of see some toss ups here or there. And you also consider the fact too, that on par with the bears, you're going to have that game where they're supposed to win and they don't like you're probably supposed to be winning the giants game or the jets game very easily could lose one of those games or, you know, on the other end, they have that game where they're usually not favored to win and they win. It happens every single year. They have that one game where they pull off a big upset. Maybe they beat the Bills at Soldier Field. And maybe they have a chance, you know, in the hunt. You know, maybe, you don't know. Or they don't have a chance of the hunt, but they still do somehow pull off a win against the Bills. I mean, that's the crazy thing about the NFL is, you really can win any game. The chances are obviously low, but I mean, remember the Colts last year, they got knocked out because they couldn't beat Jacksonville. Yeah. Didn't the lions destroy the Cardinals last year? They did. I mean, it, it happens. It's, it's football. Um, but you know, again, put, this is putting the cart way ahead of the horse, but with the, the record that you predict, The Bears next year will probably be drafting somewhere around eight through 11. And I have where I, my record is I have them drafting uh, 16 through 19 ish. Um, But if they wind up, you know, in that eight to 11 range with seven wins, I think that ends up being kind of huge for the Bears. Because I think you probably can trade back with teams that are going to be quarterback hungry and move 
and kind of like what the Giants did to the Bears last year is pick up an extra first round pick uh, and and just for by moving back a few spots and um, you could really see the Bears picking up their stud wide receiver somewhere in the middle of the first round and picking up an extra first rounder and maybe even more um, and really jump starting rebuilding this team. I don't think you can do that if you end up picking around 20th. I don't even want to think about that right now, man. <laughs> uh, but uh, the only other Bears news, um, Jesper Horstead got cut. Then no. they... People were really upset for some reason. I was. Uh, I like Jesper Horstead. I like him too, but they brought him back on an injury designation. So... Nobody seems to know what the injury is, but I think he will be back once he's healthy. Um, so he just cleared waivers. I like but, to think that inside of him, he's got viruses like in the shape of Matt Nagy's head. I don't know. <laughs> uh, but uh, they did sign a 24 year old tight end, Ryson John, um, to take Jesper Horstead's spot. I do not expect him to make this squad. Also, the Bears signed not one, but two veteran wide receivers, uh, Dante Pettis and uh, Tajay Sharp. Pettis is a 26-year-old, former second-round pick, 6'1", 195. Last season, he had 10 catches for 87 yards and a touchdown. Nothing to write home about, but it is a veteran uh, wide receiver. Um, who was pretty highly regarded coming out of college. Maybe I'm reading too much into him, but maybe he's a diamond in the rough. I possibly, I think one of these guys will make the roster. I think this is yeah. another one where this is a uh, sign two guys and hope one works out. Uh, Tajay Sharp is 6'2", 194. He was a fifth rounder in 2016, only 27 years old. Last season, he had 25 catches uh, for 230 yards and zero touchdowns, but um, he was a Kansas City Chiefs uh, practice squad player. So I feel like uh, he is a known commodity to Ryan Poles. Right. I think he knows what he's getting there. Yeah. Um, So, yeah. That's that's where we are with the Bears and uh, the the this last wave of free agency has been real slow. <laughs> it, it has been fairly non-existent. We signed these these two guys, but um, there's still a whole lot of players out there. I mean, uh, Jadavion Clowney is still unsigned. Akeem Hicks is still unsigned. Uh, uh, yeah, there's a. I mean, Will Fuller still unsigned, Julio Jones, um, Odell Beckham Jr. still unsigned. And to he's be got fair, that torn ACL, right? To be fair, he might just wait it out until he's healthy. And yeah. Then, and then sign midseason with a, the team that he thinks could, you know, yeah. win him a or help win a Super Bowl. That's that might be a smart move. Yeah, I mean, I I do that if I were him. Um, so yeah, there's there's still a a lot of a lot of names that are left, and uh, if you're to believe Eric Lambert, uh, Keem Hicks is destined to be a bear again. Mm. <laughs> mm. Anything's possible. I I just don't see Ryan Poles going for that kind of thing. Yeah, I just don't see why. Um, it's not like you're a contending team looking for depth or veteran depth at the position, you know, it's, 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 it's kind of be like, why not? Or, or why would you, I should say. It, it's kind of like, I think if you like Akeem Hicks is a good player. Um, I just feel like he is a volatile player and when things don't go the way he wants, um, it, it's not, it's not like a Jay Ratliff type situation where, the police have to escort him off the field of uh, the practice squad or the practice facility. But um, 
I just feel like he can become a, a, a headache to the coaches in the front office if things don't go the way he wants. I just think he's old and he's hurt. That that as well. Um, you know, he's just you know he's uh, he's on the wrong side of thirty. He's had a lot of injuries the past few years, and you know, just you age. age. I, I wouldn't be surprised if somebody signed him. Oh, but, me neither. Me but neither. he he might he might be there until training camp starts. And then it comes a question of, has he been motivated enough to stay hel- uh, to stay in shape? You're not a little man. Yeah, I, I have no idea. You, ha- you haven't really heard much from him or about him this offseason. No. Um, oh, one thing I forgot to mention. Did you read the Tariq Cohen? That was hard. That was that, hard to read. I, I want to just go publicly and say, I feel bad about anything I may have said about him. Me too. Um, you know, I, I, I really hope I don't know if he comes back, but I hope he does. But man, that, that was a story that started bad, went downhill. And then when it was over and they had like the, the follow-up, you know, note at the bottom of it, I was just like, Oh God. Uh, you know, it's just a reminder that this isn't Madden. These aren't computers. These are real people and they have real things going on. And it kind of reminds me of the story where, you know, the Allen Iverson, the practice, we talk about practice Mm -hmm. and a lot of people just, uses make fun of like Alan Iverson was lazy and didn't want to practice. But the real story behind it was he missed a practice because his best, he got word that his best friend had just been shot and killed Mm -hmm. and he skipped a practice to deal with that. Mm -hmm. And somebody asked him about missing practice. And he was essentially saying that it's, it's practice. You know, I was dealing with something more important in life. I missed a practice, not I'm, I'm lazy and don't practice. Uh, and, you know, I think just as sports fans in general, we need to be better about understanding that, you know, not everybody lives in this bubble where, you know, they can be Adrian Peterson and come back from an injury in like, that's a, you know, a year injury in like three weeks and be ready to go. Like everybody has, different levels of being able to come back from an injury. Sometimes they're dealing with an injury on top of catastrophic life things. Um, And, you know, we just have to be better about understanding that. Yeah. You know, it's, you never know what's going on in somebody's life. And I mean, there's some really dark details that we learn about all this stuff and just how hard Tariq Cohen tried to work to be there for his family, you know, for his siblings and, you know, hearing about what had happened to one of his siblings when he got hurt. I just, one can't even imagine what you go through when that happens. I mean, I I could never imagine that it's, it's just, it's heart wrenching. And I always liked Suri Cohen, but you know, you know, I, I would always say, you know, I'm not really sure he fits blah, 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 but man, you just, you hear about what happened and it's a humble reminder truly that these people are people that, you know, we're human, they're human. I, you know, we, this is the tip of the iceberg of what we know of people's personal lives and the hardships that some of these people go through. And just the opening of that. So if those of you don't know, um, there's a website called the players tribune and players can write things for it. Um, Dan Carcillo wrote about the, some of the concussion issues with playing hockey. Um, But people who usually write something that's, deeply personal or something that's the dark side of sports to consider uh, and, and post there. But um, Tariq Cohen wrote something and uh, about 
what what was going on that we didn't know about behind the scenes and uh and i i don't i don't want to tell his story you can read it. it it's it's worth a read it's just a hard read um i mean but right off the bat when he starts it just essentially sounds like he probably questions whether you know he should have played football or not at all yeah um probably has a lot of guilt and uh, i wonder if if that has some of the impact of why he hasn't come back i mean it sounds like there's injuries compounded things but you know I, I wonder if he has any intention to come back or if he's now in the mode of uh i've made i've made some good money let me just take care of my family and put them first i don't know yeah i, I he didn't delve into that it's but you know sort of reading into it makes you makes you ask that question absolutely but do you want to turn the 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 page here to a little baseball why don't we shall we Uh, what side of town do you want to talk uh north or south south or north uh i guess we could start with the white Sox. um yeah i mean white Sox. uh had a real rough series against the the New York Yankees. Um, it's putting that, it lightly. Yeah, that was. Um, it made you realize that the Yankees are a really good team, and the it's tough to have a track meet against them. Yeah, you know, the game you did win was a, a low scoring one, but they they really they really ran you out of the park. John Carlos Stanton and Aaron Judge are just monsters. I mean, physically and the way they play. I mean, the the opposite field power that Stanton has, man, if Stanton didn't have a bunch of injury issues over the years, I think he hit 700 home runs. I think he is the best pure power hitter in the game. He's just so strong. It's unreal. He like, Dylan Cease throws him like, you know, looking at the the highlight reels, you, you see the everything that happens when they swing and they turn something into everything. So when Cease throws a fastball up and Stanton just goes out, just kind of casually swings at it, and it ends up being just a line drive piss missile into the seats. I mean, that that's the kind of easy power very few people possess. And on top of that, like you can look all the way up and down their lineup. Like the fact that they have guys on their lineup that can do things that a lot of players on other teams can't. Like DJ LeMayhew or the guy that came that I think he was on the Rangers and he was on the Twins and then he went over in the Gary Sanchez trade. I'm blanking on his name, but like, like those are guys on their team that consistently produce around around their main main players i mean just the way that team functions is what you want i mean even old man josh donaldson is still producing and look you know anthony rizzo has been producing for them it hasn't been as good recently but you know, you got some good production from him. And then that's just speaking for their lineup. You know, they got some fireball pitchers in there too. I mean, the it's, it's May. I'm not saying that this is the end of the White Sox season by any means. But right now, one team at guaranteed right field looked like a championship team and the other did not. You know, I believe in the White Sox. It's they ran into a team that the Yankees, when things are going well, can just destroy teams and they caught them at the wrong time. Uh, The White Sox are another team that can do this to you. I mean, you look at you look at that lineup and um, we got to see it this year, man. You're you're right. but 
you know, at least you're starting to get the closer to the right <clears throat> lineup. Tim Anderson leading off, <clears throat> uh, Moncada batting second, uh, Robert and Abreu three and four, Andrew Vaughn <clears throat> five, and then, you know, uh, the shitty hitters down at the bottom. But when Eloy comes back, you really, you could really put up some numbers and I, but you're right. Vaughn's coming back for an injury. So we'll see how he starts playing, but Abreu needs to pick it up. Um, Grandal has been terrible. Grandal has been awful, <clears throat> awful. Um, Abreu has been tough. Uh, you know, we'll see what Mankata can do. Tim but, Anderson's a hitting machine. He's one of the best pure hitters I've ever seen. And Luis Robert looks much better. Those two are producing. It's hard to be critical of them. It's just you need your other guys to step up. You know, Abreu and Grandal. I don't and, even think Abreu uh, is hitting over 200 at this point. Um, AJ Pollock started off really well, and he's really struggled now. Mm -hmm. um, Lurie, Lurie keeps getting playing time, and he's terrible. Um, he's been hitting better recently, but overall, you know, he's still, he's still under 200 batting average. Reese McGuire can't hit, um, Josh Harrison. Yeah. He's hit. terrible. Uh, Gavin sheets has at least been showing you some power lately. Yeah. He's not like a huge average OBP guy, but he could, he could slug the ball. Like he hits it far, you know, that, that, that's, there's at least value there. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, you see, you see him and he's you're like, okay, all right. Uh, what is he up to four home runs in a, in a, he doesn't play that often. Um, but he's, he's a 700 OPS right now, which is not terrible. Um, but, uh, Vaughn is back. That's good for the uh, the White Sox. Lucas Giolito, I, I, I saw they went on the injured list. I'm like, what the hell happened to him? But turns out it's the precautionary. They're putting him on the COVID list because um, he had some some symptoms. But it sounds like they're not, it's not COVID, and he probably won't miss a start. Um, Which is good because that's that's important. Yeah. Uh, you know, you we, we had laughed beginning of the season that, you're really starting off playing Vince Velasquez every five starts or every five games. And, uh, and then he started pitching. Not so bad. He got lit up by the Yankees. Um, yeah. And you know, again, tough assignment, but yeah. Dylan Cease and Joe Kelly com combined to get lit up. Kelly's been awful so far and it's only a small sample size. So very small. I, I wouldn't, it's very small. I'm not going to write him off by any means, but ye, it's been ugly so far. And then, so you, you get blown out 15 to seven by the Yankees, 10 to four by the Yankees. And then you're a Saturday, you're pitching Dallas Keuchel and you gotta be as a white Sox fan going, ah, oh, shit. Yeah. And he pitches great. Yeah. I mean, give him a lot of credit. His last two outings have been good. And you know, he located his stuff well and he got them off balance. So that was real big props to him. Yeah. And then you had uh, Liam Hendricks have a two inning out, uh, two inning save. Um, they blew the save. Oh, did he? He blew the save and then they walked it off. Okay. Um, but he, he still pitched two innings to, to close that game out. Um, <clears throat> and he's been up and down. Yeah. I, you know, I, I think that as ugly as some of those Yankees games were the, the blown game against the, the guardians when they were up eight to two, he, you know, Oof. that when you're, I feel so bad is Kopech pitched a hell of a game. That game. Uh, He's in, great. He's amazing. Six innings pitched two hits, seven strikeouts and going into the ninth inning, you're up eight to two. You have to feel pretty good. Yeah, I mean, most teams would. And they lose 12 to 9. Josh Naylor single-handedly beating them. It's like, wow. Um, that was a that was a tough loss because you you look at the whole week as a whole, 
And you're like, okay, if you beat, if you win that game, then uh, you, know, you win Monday, Tuesday against Cleveland, and you take one of three. Oh, I guess they lost today against the Yankees, didn't they? Um, yeah, it, it's just tough. That that would have been a nice victory had they been able to hang on. I, I, you know, the between the injuries and the inconsistent pitching and some of the hitting woes, like I, I I'm not putting a you know a nail in the coffin of this team, but. I'm not either. They, because they, they can, they have the potential to play really well. It's not like these are their scrub players that, you know, overachieve to get them places. They're, you know, if they play to what they're supposed to play, this is a, you know, this is a, a, a legit team. Um, yeah, I, I still think they'll be fine in the long run. I, I could see this team going off in the second half when things are healthy and if things are okay. I wouldn't rule them out going absolutely going on an absolute tear. I mean, we saw the Braves do it. We saw the Nationals do it in 2019. This team could be the 2019 Nationals or last year's Braves. So the second half, after a rough start, they just kick it into gear and they're off to you know maybe a championship run. I'm not ruling that off at any point. I just think that you need to get serious at some point. And I just, I look at white Sox management and I just feel at times that they just say, you know what, let's just win this crappy division and then we'll figure it out from there. You just, you gotta be more aggressive than that. And then you just gotta be a bit more serious with what you're playing. I mean, I still think this team has so much potential and that this team can be great for the next three plus years. It's just when you see the same problems, it gets frustrating. And a while you lose a little more and more patience with it. But again, I, I, st- I if I'm a betting man, I still say they win the division. I still say they're going to make the postseason just fine. Uh, this could be the worst stretch we see all season. We'll see what happens. I mean, um, they, they know, didn't they didn't play well this week and they still gained a game on the Twins. The twins, twins are not playing that well, so they're three games behind. And you have a great chance against the Royals. Five games against the Royals, you could crush them in Kansas City, and everything will be just fine. Right. I have a quick question. I'm just looking at the standings here. Right now, the Yankees are 25 and nine, and on the flip side of that, the Reds are nine and 26. Who? Do you think that, uh, what do you think will be the greater number? The number of losses that the Yankees have at the end of the season or the number of wins that the Reds have at the end of the season? Mm. I'm going to say Yankee wins. I, you know, I Yankees losses versus Reds wins. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So Uh, if, if the Yankees, if the Yankees win a hundred games, they will be 162. So do the Reds have more than 62 wins? Well, they just uh, threw a no hitter and lost today. Um, the Reds have been awful so far, but at the same time, I don't know if they're as awful, but then again, if you trade away like Luis Castillo and some other guys, I- I'm going to say right now that, as of right now, they're going to win just under 62 games. So let's say the Yankees win 101 games. So that would be 61 losses. I think the Reds right now win 60 games. So slight, slight advantage to Yankees losses. I think, I think the, Reds win 52 games this year. That low, huh? I'm going 52. The Reds. You know, are... most of those wins are going to be against the Cubs. Well, yeah, but, you know, they can't play the Cubs all the time. That's true. I mean, they're on pace right now to be. Uh... The pace, I know the pace is absolutely terrible. 
they're on pace to win 41, 42 games. So. It's just, oh man, I know we've seen it in, in recent years with like the Orioles and the Diamondbacks. It's just, man, it is really hard not to win at least 55 games. Over 162. It is really hard not to win that many games, but it's possible and they could. I mean, 2019, the Orioles won 54, the Tiger, the Royals won 59, the Tigers won 47. Um, Let's see, 2018. Uh, the Orioles won 47 and the Royals won 58. So we, I mean, in 2017, the Giants won 64. Um, I mean, we've in the last few years, we've had some terrible teams and I think I think that the Reds this year are going to be right there with some of these really bad Orioles teams. Well, and the Reds too. I mean, that's a team that basically came out, like came out and sent the message. We're not trying, even though the ownership tried to tell you, Oh, we're trying, we're trying to win and you're not going to go anywhere. I mean, you know, that, that, that seems a disaster. I mean, they're nine and 26 right now. It's, it's it's grim. There, there's no question about it. I mean, this is this is really setting up the movie Major League. It is. It really, really is. And you know, Sean, I'm looking at records in baseball right now. I mean, you got the Reds at nine and twenty-six. The Royals, who the White Sox have a grand opportunity to get right against, are t- are twelve and twenty. And then you, the, the Tigers. I thought the Tigers were going to be better than they were so far, but you know, they're not really good. I know they just swept a series, but their overall record, it's, it's, it's pretty rough. Uh, trying to find them. I'm just looking at the final scores. Okay. So they're 12 and 23 that get yeah, pretty bad. Um, you know, you, you got some pretty bad teams and our, our Cubs are 13 and 20, not good at all, but you know, the Reds are the only team not to reach double digit wins. And it's May 15th. That's pretty damn awful. I just want to know the Reds, who is their Pedro Serrano? Um, who is their Willie Mays Hayes? Albert Almora. Who's their Roger Dorn? Who's their that's got to be Votto at this team. <laughs> well, nah, maybe Jake Taylor's more Joey Votto. I but... think Jake Taylor and Joey Votto are probably uh, the veteran leader. And, and you know, jo- Joey Votto th- has been pretty good since joining uh, the internet, joining the yeah. social medias. He's been pretty funny. Boy, I just. I'm looking at their current their, their current roster, and if they didn't have that sell off last year, they could have been. I mean, last year they won eighty some games. They were in a playoff race until they fell apart at the end. But you know, if you keep that team around and maybe make a few improvements, then you know you you had a team that could at least be solid competitive and maybe in a wild card race. And they just they tore it the f down. I mean, really, all you have left in terms of lineup is Votto when he's healthy, which right now he's not, and Mike Moustakis, Tyler Naquin. I mean, Eugenio Suarez is gone. You know, that was a big bat. Nick Castellanos is obviously gone. Uh, Jesse Winker, you know, th- those guys are gone. You have Matt Reynolds, Tommy Pham, Mike Moustakis, Albert Almora Jr., Tyler Naquin. I mean, those and Colin Moran. Is you Mike know, is Mike Moustakis there, Roger Dorn? I, I think you could say that. That's funny to think that Albert Almora could be there, Willie Mays Hayes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. Uh, that is funny. They, they lost a no-hitter today. Yeah, it's really hard to do. That is 
really, really hard to do. And Albert Almora in 25 at bats is batting 320. God, isn't it? Isn't it going to be great next week when the Cubs go to Great American Ballpark and Albert Almora just looks like freaking like Rod Carew against them? I, I, if he is, I will just be so mad. I'll laugh. I'll just be like, this is so expected. <sighs> what did he bat last year? Um, did he even play last year? He did. He played for the Mets in 47 games. And do you know what his batting average was? Wasn't it like, I- I'm remembering this now. He played with the Mets. It was like below 120. It was like 115 or something. 115. He slashed 115. 148, 173 with a 321 OPS. That was Theo Epstein's first pick. Remember that. Yeah. It makes him long for the days of his last season with the Cubs where he batted 167 with a uh, slash 167, 265, 200. And I was really high on him early on. I mean, look at his first two years or his first three years, really. You know, 47 games, 2016, that's 277, has the crucial tag up in game seven. 2017, man, 132 games. He batted 298. I, yeah, I, I saw legit promise in him then. Yeah, it just, the, the, the wheels fell off. Just, you know, don't know what happened. Uh, all right, should we flip this over to the Cubs? Why don't we? Let me sum up how bad the Cubs week was. Nico Horner is on the injured list because he tripped over an umpire. The IL man, you got Horner, Madrigal. You know, you still have David Bodie rehabbing. Angelton Simmons finally came back. Uh, You had COVID with Stroman and David Robertson. I mean, half the team's out. Suzuki and, just came back and Suzuki just came back and, and that's the major league squad. Yeah. Is Ed Howard is, has a significant hip injury. Oh, Ed Howard. Oh my God. That, that was a gut punch. Brennan Davis is out with a back injury. Kind of explains the slow start. I feel like, um, but you know what I did learn from um, looking at highlights from that, that game where Ed Howard got injured so my all-time favorite baseball player is Cal Ripken Jr. And on the Fort Wayne minor league team, there's a guy who it wears number eight, like Cal Ripken did. And his name is Ripken Reyes. Huh. I'm like, that's kind of cool. But, you know, Ed Howard injury is, is bad. I don't know the extent of it but it doesn't sound like he's going to be playing the rest of the year. God, that's, he was just coming around too. That is, that is a really tough injury because Miguel Amaya is out for the year. Brandon Marquez, I don't even know what the hell is going on with him. And you almost, you know, we're lucky because the Cubs have a ton of prospects and there's a lot of prospects right now that are thriving. Caleb Killian. Caleb Killian's awesome. James Triantos is awesome. P. Crow Armstrong is unreal. DJ Hers is unreal. Even like, like the Christopher Morels and the your Hendrick Peringos, those guys are killing it right now. So question. When do we see Caleb Killian play for the Cubs this year? Maybe if they do later in the season. I just I think with the position they're in, they're not gonna rush him. So I think that if we do see him this year, it'll be later. But like He's checking all the boxes right now. He's checking all the boxes. I I would not be shocked if he is brought up sooner rather than later, especially if if you get some injuries where they're just like, you know what? Let's just see what he can do. Yeah, I, I'd love to see him pitch up here. I mean, it's been exciting to follow him. You know, DJ Hurts, he's he's probably another year away, at least 2023, I feel like. But Caleb Killian is probably the closest one of your top prospects is coming with the majors. Cause you know, unfortunately the Brennan Davis back injury has caused a little bit of a setback, but I didn't, you know, 
there were people saying that Brennan Davis should have been on the opening day roster this year. It's like, no, he was not quite ready yet. But, you know, Caleb Killian is showing every every sign that he is ready to be part of this team sooner than later. And then, you know, I, I think we will see as this season goes on, we will see Nelson Velasquez or the Christopher Morrell types where they're not high end prospects, but they're prospects that, I mean, I just, I, you know, it's like, what good is watching is going to be watching Jonathan VR the whole year or yeah. Jason Hayward the whole year. Now, Jonathan VR, who's a pretty solid ball player, is is he out of shape? Because I remember looking at him for the first few at-bats this year. I'm like, was he always that big? Like, it, it, I, I thought he was quicker, too. Like, today, I think it was the ninth inning, he hits a ground ball up the middle. It goes off Ahmed's glove. It squirts away. Ahmed picks it up and throws the first a play that I was 99.9% sure he was going to be out. He was out by like two steps and just the swing looks slow. Very, very slow. What's funny is when like at some point you're going to be like, Oh, Hey, the Cubs are calling up a couple of guys from the minors to play. And you're like, Ooh, you're getting so excited. And then it's going to be like Ben Leeper or Kane Eukert. And you're like, I don't, I don't care. Or after we DFA'd Ildemaro Vargas and he comes back, or your man, Robel Garcia. Rubble, rubble. I actually did write about Robel Garcia thinking, you know what? I wouldn't normally pine for him to come up, but you, you, you just you might need some depth while all these guys are hurt. I mean, Adrian Simmons came back today. You're not going to get anything offensively from him, but you're going to at least get a, ba- a, a glove that you can rely on. He's just a placeholder. Right. And it's like at this point, when you know the Cubs aren't going anywhere, veteran guys like that, they just, they don't serve you much because you're not going to trade them for value. You know, it's, it's not like you're going to flip VR for like something really valuable or a guy like Anderson Simmons for something really valuable or Jason Hayward for something valuable. You know, at this point, they are what they are. They're just veteran guys. You know, they're just, they're they're not everyday all-star type starters. And, you know, sure, they're experienced. And, you know, Jonathan VR has got a nice resume. But even if he was playing semi-decent, you're not going to flip a guy like VR for anything valuable. So it's just like, if you're not going anywhere and you have younger guys that you want to see, it just, it, it, it doesn't fit you much, much, you know, if you were a contending team and you say, hey, Jonathan VR is like our last guy on the bench. We can plug him in certain spots, pinch hit him. Great. Same with Anderson Simmons. Same with some of those other guys. It's just when you're bad and you're not going anywhere and you don't need veteran depth to help you win games in a lost season, I don't really care about watching Jonathan VR. I don't really care about watching Jason Hayward. Uh, you know what sucks, though, is so most of these Cubs – minor leaguers are still you know two years away uh the I mean, top tier prospects right well so brennan brennan davis probably next year mm-hmm. um christian hernandez a couple more years yeah i don't think you see hernandez until like 25 uh triantos not ready yet um caleb PCA, Kittle, yeah. Kale, uh yeah P, uh, pca probably two more years Owen oh, Casey, same thing. Um, Jordan Wicks, maybe next year. Yep. Caleb Killian this year. Uh, Kevin Alcantara, two more years. Another kid who's really swinging it well. Um, DJ Hurds, probably next year, the year after. Probably next year. Maybe um, late next year, but we'll see. Uh, Preciado, two more years. Um, so a lot of these guys are, are a couple of years away. I think we're going to see bad baseball for that time period because it's not like you can go, Hey, let's just sign some good major league players because you're signing them to more than one or two years. And instead you're going to be signing, you know, guys like VR and Simmons to keep filling roster spots until these guys come up 
I think we're going to see bad baseball for another year or two. I just, my hope is that we see more of those younger guys that aren't the top end. I think we could see Christopher Morrell at some point. I think we could see Nelson Velasquez at some point. They may not be the higher end prospects. Yeah. Velasquez will probably see at some point this year. Um, Maybe even Jared Young. I don't know if we'll see Morrell this year. I think that might be a little pushing it. Um, Maybe, maybe Riley Thompson. Maybe. I mean, I just, if you're going to be bad, be intriguing, bad, or at least fun, bad. That's what I asked for. Like this past week was actually pretty fun. That four and two road trip was enjoyable to watch. Not every inning was enjoyable to watch, but they could have easily gone six and zero. They lost two games by one run, one game in which Frank Schwindel would have absolutely had a grand slam if it was at this time last year with the different balls. No yeah. doubt in my mind. And, you know, you got you got some timely hitting from some of these guys. You know, Suzuki looked like he was prior to his slump, you know, when the season started. You, you got Jan Gomes doing things and. You know, Jan Gomes is one of those veterans that actually might serve this team well because I think he calls a great game behind the dish. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, you've got two really good starts out of Kyle Hendricks. Mm-hmm. Justin uh, Steele looks really good today. Yeah. Uh, I, Wade Miley did not look good. Um, no, but it, it was his first time back, and I'll, I'll, get, I'll give him a pass for that one. You know, Smiley didn't look good, but he didn't look terrible against Arizona. Um, I, I no disrespect to Smiley, but I think he was due for a little bit of regression. He's not overpowering. He's not, yeah. you know, you know, he doesn't have great stuff. But you know, you were going to see a few mess starts from him at some point. And I mean, right now, Sean. You just got to take the good because this team isn't good. You know, this is not a good team. I just, I want to see respectable play like we saw this past week because the week before that was a joke. I mean, that was a complete joke. We know this team is going nowhere. At least give us some things to watch. And at least we had that this past week. I mean, you want to talk about one of the most Jekyll and Hyde duos ever. That's Patrick Wisdom and Frank Schwindel. Today, they got the job done. Yeah, You know, the day before they're striking out every at bat. Schwindel got, you know, sent down and then immediately brought back up for reasons. I don't know if that COVID thing had something to do with it and they just needed bodies. I have no idea. But Schwindel has not been good. And. You know, I said early the start of the season that I I wanted to give him a chance, not saying I believed in him, but I would rather see them give him a chance than have some, you know, old ass veteran. Um, and all right, Schwindel is not the answer. Oh, we we know that. We know that now. He's a placeholder. He's a placeholder, and that's fine. But I'm glad we learned that definitively. Patrick Wisdom has, is a placeholder as well. I think he is a better placeholder be, just because of the power that the he power, has. power, yeah. Um, but, and he, he's a decent fielder. Um, so, I, I, but again, we learned that these guys are placeholders. And there's, and I'm, I'm if you're going to lose, at least lose and learn something gain from it and you know sometimes just learning who's not a long-term piece is a good thing you know there's there's way too much time where guys or teams will give up on a guy and then he goes somewhere else and succeeds and you're always happy for the player you're like okay the good they succeeded but it always sucks when your team is the one that gave up on him uh i mean the orioles have to just be like kicking themselves in the ass for giving up uh jake the snake and, and Pedro's trope. True. Um, 
you know, so you just don't like when your team is the one that gives up on somebody and Schwindel and wisdom, you're like, okay, they had good seasons last year. Is it, it just took them a really long time to figure it out or was it fluke? Yeah. Okay. It just seems fluky. Um, although wisdom, wisdom could end up having a similar season. It's just not good Wis- enough. Wisdom just is what he is. Yeah. He's going to hit the ball hard when he does make contact, but he's going to strike out a ton. I mean, what he struck out like four times yesterday. And then today he has a booming home run and a booming double that were just absolutely smoked. And then Schwindel drove in the winning run. You know, this was after a day. Those two were, d- didn't really do anything. I mean, those are placeholders. That's all good. The the hitting I want to see more than anything is from the guys like Suzuki, Hap, Horner, Madrigal, because those are your future guys. And I love Wilson Contreras. He's hitting the ball. I just, I, I think he's going to be traded. Oh yeah. Cause there's, there's no extension talks and hopefully he keeps playing good baseball. So that when he, you trade him, you get the most value for him. I, I'm very mixed on that whole thing. I don't want him to go. I don't and either, but he's not going to stay either. No. So either ex- like, it's like just rip the bandaid off. You know, when the time comes, either extend him or trade him. You can't go into the off season with him lame duck. You either got to trade him or you got to extend him. I mean, that's just, that's what you got to do. And I mean, with Wilson, I just, I see the bat and I'm like, I know there's concern about his catching in the long run, but you got a DH now. Yeah. You know, you got a DH he, spot and maybe he plays other positions. He's he done could, it before. He's played first base. You don't have a steady first baseman. Right. Exactly. Convert, I mean, convert him. Exactly. I just, at the same time, if you get a haul of like several prospects that are like top tier and near major league ready, that's hard to pass up with the position you're in. And here's my thing about Wilson Contreras. Is he a long-term catcher? Mm, probably not. Okay. Then it comes down to, is his bat worth not trading him for future picks when you're on a team that's rebuilding? Um, I don't think so. And if he was a long-term catcher, you were like, okay, because we don't have another catcher. We have Jan Gomes, but we don't have anybody else. Um, and and you go, okay, I, I we just we will resign him because he fans do love him, and uh, we need a catcher. But if he's not going to be playing full-time catcher, and like, okay, is it worth signing him for to a bunch of money when he's not making our team better? I mean, I guess you do have to spend the money on somebody. Um, but I personally, if you can get a haul for him, I take it. Yeah, I mean, especially I, if you if you find a team that's in the hunt that loses their catcher, like exploit that. Take a Take whatever you can from them. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those things where you're going to see what the trade market is like. You know, if you don't extend them and you're you're going to be shopping him, you're going to see what the trade market is like. And there could be a significant trade market for him. But, you know, you got to get there first. I, You know, you're going to be speculating on what's going to be happening until the trade deadline comes. It's not like you're going to wake up tomorrow and Wilson Contreras is going to be dealt. So, you know, this is something that's going to linger for a few more months. Oh yeah. I, I mean, he, this is, he's going to be a, a tr- the last day trade. He's not getting traded early. Yeah. I just, you know, that, it, it sucks. It sucks that we're in mid May. And we know that this season in terms of going anywhere is already shot. It sucks. And this looming over doesn't make it any easier either. Now we went through it last year on a much bigger scale. So right now you just try to look for all the positives and you know what? Following the Cubs farm system has actually been pretty damn fun. Like all the teams are playing well, 
most of these prospects are playing well. But, you know, you look at the major league team and it's like, well, you know, this isn't good. We didn't expect it to be good, but it's still not very fun. So if we could just see a few more weeks like this week, and that's, that's all I can really ask for. Just give me some respectable baseball because the bar is set pretty damn low. And if Wilson Contreras is going to up his value, let him up his value. Get Nico Horner back. Let him keep hitting. Pray to God that magical ends up being something. You know, you just, you hope for that kind of stuff. Hope you keep seeing Suzuki swing it. You know, it just, you got to look for the positives everywhere you can. I mean, the hope is you can actually win some games coming up because you got a a three game set against the Pirates and another four games against the Diamondbacks and and then you get a four game set against the Reds. I mean, on paper, the schedule eases up a crap ton, but then, but then it lights right back up on fire. You get two against the white Sox. Yep. And, and then the brewers. Yep. Then the Cardinals for like nine mm-hmm. in a row. Um, and yep. I, oh, I, God, I crazy. get to spend my birthday seeing the Cardinals kick the crap out of the, the Cubs. Oh yeah. Um, and look, but, even with the White Sox struggling right now, they're light years better than the Cubs right now. I mean, they proved that in their last series. So I'll put it this way. So right now we are about 20% done with the season. The Cubs are 27th in starter ERA in baseball. So right at the bottom. And they are dead last in number of innings pitched by the starter. Yeah. Yep. I'll say this, though. Bullpen's actually been pretty good. I mean, better than we expected. I mean, Scott Efros is a dude. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I wouldn't say that they're, they're good. They're all serviceable, and there's some dudes on there, and uh, they're – significantly better than we were expecting because I was real worried about this bullpen. Well, you know, if David Robertson keeps this up, that is a prime trade piece right there. Like Kimbrell last year, you're not going to, he's not going to have the same value as Kimbrell. I don't think because Kimbrell throws 99 and misses a lot of bats. And, you know, it, Robertson's more of a cutter guy, but if he keeps getting the job done, then, then you got a trade piece right there. So closers always have a, a trade market. Always, 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 always. Um, you know, because they're, they're valuable. Uh, but I mean, this is still early. Uh, I mean, we're, we're what a good two and a half months from the trade deadline. (laughs) We got a while, but we already know what's going to be happening at the trade deadline. Um, Contreras likely gone. Um, and Robertson likely gone. And who else do you see? You said Robertson, you said Contreras. I I think, you know, I mean, VR right now, VR is playing to a DFA more than a trade, but if, if VR comes around, you'll probably flip him. Not for much, but you'll flip him if he yeah, actually just, has any value. But I, I don't know if he has any value. Not right now. Not right now. Um, I'm Andrew good. Simmons has any value. I, I don't think he does. There's one name I'm I'm gonna wait on and see if you say it. But um, there, you know, you you've trade most everything you can trade. You're gonna you say Kyle to. Hendricks, aren't you? I am not. No, Kyle Hendricks, huh? Okay. Oh, are you saying Ian Happ? Ian Happ. You know, I got to say, there might be an opportunity to trade him when his value might not be higher. If if he is playing well at the All-Star break, I think you have to consider trading him because... At least uh, see what teams would be interested in giving you. Yeah. I mean, if you don't get them a value, then yeah, obviously no. But if right. you get value, obviously you, you got to consider it because your uh, your outfield's going to get crowded pretty darn quick because Suzuki's mm-hmm. not going anywhere, right? 
and you expect Brendan Davis to be up next year. He, for right now, is your future outfielder. You know, we don't know how he's going to turn out in the majors, but for all intents and purposes, we expect the future center fielder to be Brennan Davis. Um, so, uh, you know, you, you've got other guys that you, and then, you know, going forward, uh, there's going to be a, a poop ton of, of potential outfielders that could be your future guy. And it's not a knock on, on Ian Happ. It's just... You know, you're clearing a path, you're a rebuilding team, might as well just keep replenishing the farm system. And- right. And and I'm not one to say I want to trade Ian Happ, but it might be the thing to do with the position you're in. It would be a disservice not to at least see what the value could be when you're in this position. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's more of a, it's not like uh, you're like, oh yeah, I want to trade him. I want to get rid of him. It, it's just if if there's value to be had uh, I, I it's probably a smart decision you know sell sell while you can it's not like ian happ is not on this team when they compete for their next world series most likely not most likely not i want to play a quick game with you something just i just pulled out of my my rear end okay The Cubs and White Sox have made a number of trades over the past few years. And I think the Sox will be buying, will be selling. I'd be shocked if the Sox are not in a position to buy. I still think they're going to make the postseason just fine. So for now, they're buyers in my view. Let's say they want to call the Cubs again for some veteran reinforcements. Is there a player on the Cubs you think that would fit the White Sox perfectly going forward? That would be sellable. Um, Nick Madrigal. I, I mean, just kidding. Uh, you know, you could you could always Dave Robertson could be valuable to them um, as another mm-hmm. bullpen arm. Reunion, uh, yay! Um, obviously there's a catcher that you could trade to them. That's going to be better than hit better hitter than the two catchers they have. Um, I, I think either of those guys would be somebody that they would, uh, um, be willing to take. If the, if the white Sox aren't going to be dishing out for like, um, a Frankie Montas, if the, the A's are still interested in shopping him and Rick Hahn calls and they say, we want Andrew Vaughn and they say no. And they're like, you know what? We got to pick up some starter depth somewhere. You know, do they call the Cubs about maybe a Wade Miley? I could see it if Wade Miley's pitching well. Oh yeah. I forgot about Wade Miley. Uh, Smiley and Miley will be on the trade block, obviously. If, yep. if, mm-hmm. they're, if their value is there. Um, uh, who who do you think the White Sox would be willing to part with that you would want from their farm system? Well, you know, obviously, Yoki Cespedes and Oscar Colas are guys I'd like, but I don't think they're willing to part with them, especially not Oscar Colas. Uh, you know, the, the one guy, what's his name? Is it Montgomery? I know they're not going to trade him. No, Montgomery, Colas, I think are off. Um, I mean, those are their big prospects. Yelke, maybe, but I, he, he's so close to being ready. I don't, I think you, um, I think you really have to, you'd have to really give them something because, you know, the closer you get to a player being ready to, to play, the more known commodity, the less likely they are to, tr- to, uh, you know, trade, uh, you have to you have to give up a lot to get the player like that. Um, I mean, really, I think if the Cubs make a deal with the Sox this year and it's a guy like a Miley or, you know, some sort of non Wilson Contreras type player, it's probably going to be close to what you saw with Tapera last year, where you got that one lefty pitcher from the White Sox farm system. It's not it's not going to be anything huge. 
yeah, like a, maybe like a West calf could be had because he's he's young. I mean, he's not expected to come up until like 2025. And I'm not sure that the Cubs are going to really think that Micker Adolfo is worth much at this point, right? I don't know. I mean, but is he is he in a position of of need for the Cubs? They got, not they got really. a lot. They got no. a lot of outfielders, right? Um, I mean, uh, he's hitting fine. Looking at his stats, he's hitting 288 this year. Hmm. Seems like uh, he's hitting better than he was before. So, you know, it's good for him. Oh, yeah. I mean, 2019, he hit 227. 2021, he hit 245. He's hitting 288. This is slashing 288, 341, 463 with an 804 OPS. Like, he's not a big power guy this year. He hit 25 home runs better. last year, but he's hitting better. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. So. I mean, I wouldn't be opposed to taking him, but uh, it's, uh, you know, your your outfield is, you know, future outfield is going to be uh, Pete Cora Armstrong, Brennan Davis, and and Suzuki, probably. PCA. Um, you also have Owen Casey coming up there, and Kevin Alcantara. So you Kevin got, Alcantara, he could swing it, man. Have you seen some of his recent highlights? I have. You've got a lot of outfielders, so you do. like I, that's that's why I'm saying is is if you could sell high on on Ian Happ, you might want to because uh, sure, probably next year you're going to need to bring in a veteran on a one or two year deal, but um, I, I would rather do that and sell high on Ian Happ because he's going to get pushed out anyway at some point. Yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens. We got a ways away to get there, but, you know, it's going to be, you know, the, the, it's going to be lingering over our heads. Not quite like last year, but it's still going to be lingering over our heads. The, the idea of selling at the deadline again. Oh, absolutely. And, and you know, everybody's going to be, and that's when you're on a bad team. Uh, you're a decent player on a bad team. You always have to be thinking that in the back of your head, like how much longer am I going to be on this team? Because it's, uh, you know, flipping guys at the deadline is, you know, a, a thing that happens every year. <laughs> yeah. So there's going to be plenty of guys on the Cubs that have to just be thinking, all right, how much longer am I going to be playing for the Cubs? And, uh, you know, there's some guys that don't really have to worry. I don't think Frank Schwindel is getting traded. <laughs> I don't think, no, Patrick, I don't think so either. And, and most of them are, it's because they can't get traded rather than like, oh yeah, we're not trading this guy, but you're right. M- Miley and Smiley got to be on the block. Robertson has to be on the block. Uh, Ian Happ, Wilson Contreras. Um I don't, I don't think VR Simmons are on the block just because they're not good. Um, they fall in that bucket. Um, I think yeah, the other of the three buckets, the guys that are definitely on the block guys that would be on the block if they didn't suck. And then guys that you don't want to trade because they're part of the future. And for the Cubs, it sucks right now because not that bucket's pretty empty. Yep. What fun, you know, I mean, uh, you know, your, your, your middle bucket of guys that you can't trade because they, they suck is or injured. It's pretty full. God, when you're, you're mentioning bucket, I just think puke bucket at this point. Oh, (laughs) so I, I'm not one that's really following this, uh, this trial of Amber Heard and Johnny Depp, but I did see a funny meme that had, so Johnny Depp was in the very first Freddy Krueger movie. And there's a scene where he gets killed and he's laying in his bed. Freddy Krueger's glove comes up from the bed and he kills him. And there was a picture of Freddy Krueger getting ready to kill him while Johnny Depp is in bed from that movie. And it just said the second worst thing that's ever happened in Johnny Depp's bed. Ooh. 
And for those that are not following the trial, Amber Heard is accused of pooping in his bed because she was mad at him. Oh, that's, ugh. <laughs> and so when you brought up buckets, I brought up buckets, but you reminded me that I said buckets. All I could think of was a poop bucket. And that made me think of Amber Heard. <laughs> uh so yeah the, the 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 bucket of players that are either not good enough to warrant or anybody wanting to trade for them or are injured is is pretty pretty full right now yeah yeah it's uh it's gonna be a long rest of the few months of the season that's for sure so Hey, the White Sox are struggling, but at least they're still well in that postseason race. And I, I think they're going to come around. I still think they'll be all right. They, they got some things to clean up. They got some things to get better. We'll get to the postseason when we get there, but I, I think they will get there. And so at least, you know, they have something to play for. Cubs really don't. You just got to see what you have at this point. So I just got a text from my best friend. We both have kids that are seven. Mm-hmm. and his son's name is Graham and my daughter's name is Asha. And he just texted me and said, Graham and Asha will be 15 when Seth Jones is a free agent. Oh my. And I now I'm in a bad mood. <laughs> Way to go. I was like, Way to go. I was like, what a terrible text. Why would you say that to somebody? That's those are fighting words. Those are fighting words. I'm just fighting words. Uh, but is there anything else you want to talk about? No, I think I've said my piece. Well, I think that's going to do it for this episode of Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. I want to thank everybody so much for listening. Please hit subscribe however you listen to podcasts, whether it's iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, Google Play, Spotify, etc. Share this podcast with your friends. That's how we grow the show. Follow us on social media at Swirsky Sports facebook.com slash Swirsky sports Swirsky sports.com or at shy fan pat two. And you can follow all the cool stuff that Alex does at uh, Alexander J pat creative.com. And uh, again, thank you guys so much for listening. And until next time, bear down. Cubs win. What a lucky break. The good Lord wants the Cubs to win. We think Dick, uh, and God for all they have provided. Oh, Cubs win! Cubs win! Cubs win! Oh, I don't want her. You can have her. She's a Packer fan. She can't fit in my van. And she looks like the number New Yorkers. Smoking crack is not legal on the plains. Bears 31 to negative 7. The Bears! Oh, when the Bears go bearing.